if I do a base, this works. Okay. Yeah, can you just speak? Sure. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me properly? Okay. Some... Yes. Okay. So, uh, Miguel Angel Sanchez Martinez uh, uh, is going to tell us about linear and non-linear optical responses of chiral multiple semimetrics. And again, uh, 20, 20 minutes is five or 15 minutes. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I want, first of all, to thank the organizers for letting, letting me share my work here today with you. And I want to thank you for staying until the latest talk we have had so far, I think. So today uh, I want to talk about the, the linear and nonlinear optical responses of chiral multifold semi metals, which is the work I did as a PhD student at Nell Institute under the supervision of Adolfo Grushin. So um, the basic idea here is that I will first explain a little bit what are these multifold uh, fermions, these multifold semi metals, and then how to probe them uh, using uh, linear and linear optical responses. Uh, disclaimer, mostly linear, a bit of nonlinear, but okay. So let's start. So in, in a crystal, we can find different uh, type of uh, crystal symmetries, and these crystal symmetries can protect different numbers of crossings at a, a time reversal invariant momenta in the in the brilliant zone in particular we find that they can only protect these five types of multifold crossings of bands okay so we see we have a twofold uh, crossing and uh, fo a fourfold crossing a threefold crossing another a uh, sixfold crossing and another fourfold crossing so what is interesting here is that we can think of the low energy excitations near these uh, multifold crossings as um, generalized bile fermions in the sense that if we look at the low, en at the low energy Hamiltonian here, uh, they will be th they will have the same form as a vial Hamiltonian, but instead of having a spin one half poly matrix, we will have uh, the spin that is indicated here below each of the pictures. And, um, and here I'm only talking about chiral multifold fermions. And I mean chiral in the sense that the bands have a non-zero churn number, okay? Additionally, we could find an eightfold degeneracy, uh, but that is not uh, the case of uh, the non-zero churn number in the bands. Additionally, if we look at the at the Hamiltonians of the double bile and the sixfold fermions, we find that we can all, always bring those Hamiltonians into a block diagonal form of two biles and two threefold fermions. So, if we want to study uh, in the in the simplest case so using a k dot p low energy models, these multifold fermions, we need only to focus on vial threefold and fourfold fermions. Okay, so. We know that we can potentially find this in some uh, crystals. Another question is, how can we probe the, sy the system experimentally to find something that indicates that indeed we have this type of uh, crossings? So the answer to that is uh, we would like to find an observable that is not extremely difficult to measure and that has some uh, fingerprints that we can associate to the presence of uh, these uh, multiple crossings. And that observable is the optical conductivity. So when I have a piece of material, I can apply an electric field and this will induce a current density in the material and the coefficient relating the, the induced current and the applied electric field is the dioptical conductivity, right? So for now, from now, uh, uh, let's restrict ourselves to the linear regime where we only consider terms uh, linear in the, in the electric field. So in the case of the vial fermion, uh, the optical conductivity is uh, pretty well known. So we shine light uh, with energy omega, and this excites an electron. Uh, uh, just uh, when we reach an energy beyond the Pauli block regime, and the, the optical conductivity that we obtain is linear in omega with a certain coefficient that can that depends on the Fermi velocity. And we have a theta function that indicates us that, that nothing will happen until we reach a certain energy, and then the linear behavior will depart from zero, right? So we have an activation frequency and a certain slope given the Fermi velocity of the, of the valve fermion. So the question is, can we find something like this activation frequency and this uh, slope uh, 
in the case of threefold and fourfold fermions? So, well, the answer is yes, otherwise <laughs> we wouldn't be talking about this. Um, so basically when we consider a threefold fermion, uh, we are talking about an effective spin one vial, uh, vial fermion, right? And we find that we have some optical selection rules that restrict the number of uh, optical transitions that we, that we can have in the system. In particular, we find that now we have an optical conductivity that again is linear in omega, but if we compare it with the case of the vial fermion, we see that the activation frequency is different and that in fact, given the same uh, Fermi velocity, the, um, the, the slope of the optical conductivity is much larger than that of the vial fermion. In particular, it's four times larger. In the case of the fourfold Hamiltonian, the, the band structure is uh, slightly more complicated and gives rise to uh, another set of optical selection rules, we have uh, an effective spin number of three halves. And we see that in this case, we, we have two activation frequencies set by this theta function and a different slope. In particular, we see that uh, we, can, we can start exciting electrons in our systems at two thirds and at twice the, the distance from the multifold crossing to the, to the Fermi level. Okay, so, this, uh, this is uh, something that we can uh, hold on to identify the presence of different types of multifold fermions in a, in a real system. In particular, we can look at the slopes and the activation frequencies in the, in the system, right? But so far we have talked about a, a very simple uh, low energy cate of P-mobile. And if we want to, to get closer to the experiment, it would be interesting to have a more realistic model that uh, allows us to explain the optical conductivity in a wider range than uh, a K dot P model good. So to do so, we will work with, um, I'm sorry, I think that, yeah, this, uh, this thing won't go away. So uh, you're seeing some Spanish words there. Um, so in, in, we can look at the crystal symmetries of a system that can be combined in 230 different ways. Uh, this is all we get uh, without, a, uh, without magnetism. So these are the 230 space group from which 65 of them are KL. And in particular, we will focus on a space group 198. Why? Well, there are there, there some, there are uh, a couple of reasons. The first of them is that we can uh, build a tight binding model using the crystal symmetries of the material of a material crystallizing in space group 198, and we can look at its band structure. So first, when we don't consider spin orbit coupling, we see that here at the gamma point, we have a threefold uh, crossing, that will be a threefold fermion, and at the zone corner, we have a, a double by fermion, right? When we turn on spin orbit coupling, we can look at the band structure again, and we see that the threefold fermion at the zone center splits into a spin three halves fourfold fermion, and a vial fermion. And in the R point, the double vial splits into a sixfold and a vial fermion. So basically the take home message there is that if we look at both band structures, we see that when we consider both spinless and spin orbit coupled cases, we have all possible chiral multifold fermions in this space group, right? Additionally, there are uh, two good reasons to study this space group. Now that we are talking about getting closer to experiments, which are called uh, rodin city side and cobalt city side. So these are two materials that uh, crystallize in space group 198 and that uh, have a very important feature that is that they feature the multiple crossings near the Fermi level. Because so the way this was originally explored was in a, in a science paper by Barry Bradley and Jennifer Cano. And in that paper, they basically looked at every possible space group and they saw which type of multifold crossings they could have in each of them. The thing is that you need to get these multifold crossings near the Fermi level in order to see something in the optical response at low energies, right? So these two are good candidate materials. Also, they can be grown as uh, single crystals, which is rather important to get uh, uh, clean enough samples with a, without a lot of scattering. So these materials are similar, but they feature some differences. As I said, they have the multiple crossings near the Fermi level. And in particular, we see that the energy scales involved in rhodium city side, the, the energy difference between the threefold Fermi at the sun center and the double bile at the sun corner 
is twice as large in rhodium silicide as it is in, in cobalt silicide. Okay, so we will focus for now on, on rhodium silicide. In fact, for the for the rest of the talk, if there's someone interested in cobalt silicide, we can discuss it later. And now the question is, can we use this tight binding model based on the symmetries, on the crystal symmetries uh, that protect these multiple crossings to explain the optical conductivity that we measured in the in the in the lab? So we will consider the, the tie binding model where we fitted the tie binding parameters to some uh, uh, DFT calculation, and we will explore three different values for the for the position of the of the Fermi level. So as we see, there is a there is a, a middle band here with a large curvature, and this will mean that we are in a very different situation in a very different situation whether we are above or below the the multifold crossing. Okay, so. Here we will compare the, the results for the different uh, positions of the Fermi level with the experimental data for the optical conductivity measured by Professor Liang Gu and his group. So as a first step, we will compare with a simple K.P model that I showed at the beginning. And we see that we are basically missing every feature. We are not capturing the activation frequency or the slope or anything in the, in the material. Now uh, we jump and we start using the, this tie binding model and here uh, we will start above the, the, the threefold node, right? So the first thing that we see is that the, the estimation of the, of the um, uh, activation frequency is, is not bad, but if we look at the, at the expressions of the optical conductivity, it doesn't tell us whether we are above or below the node. It just tells us the distance from the multifold crossing to the, to the Fermi level. Then we see a first quasi-linear region where the optical conductivity is dominated by the presence of the threefold fermion at the zone center. And when we reach some energy around the 600 uh, milliEV, the, the R point activates and the optical conductivity of the, of the double bile fermion starts to contribute. As we sweep the, the, the chemical potential, and we move to, to lower positions of the, of the Fermi level, we see that the, the activation of the double bile point starts to displace to lower energies. And this makes sense. If you look at this energy scale, it is larger than this energy scale, basically. And also we start to appreciate some features at low energy, that this uh, characteristic peak and deep structure, okay? And when you go about uh, 100 milliV below the, the threefold node, we see that uh, we have, uh, a rich structure, but we are not capturing the optical conductivity. So what, what is happening here? Well, uh, we know uh, uh, from our discussions with our experimentalist collaborators that in fact, there's some disorder in the sample. So we need to account for this some, somehow. So we introduced a, a finite broadening in, a, in our calculation, a, a simple uh, uh, disorder um, uh, lifetime. And we see that when, when we consider the, the, the position of the Fermi level below the threefold node, and with, uh, with this coarse approximation of uh, a constant uh, scattering lifetime of 100 milliB, we capture the behavior uh, uh, in the first uh, region. And then we, we see the, the, um, the turning upward of the activation of the R points. So using a uh, Type binding model based exclusively on the symmetries protecting the the, the threefold and double bile nodes, and uh, introducing a very simple uh, scattering lifetime in the in the um, in the calculation, we are able to to obtain a, a decently good agreement between the experimental prediction and the and the uh, measure um, uh, optical conductivity up to a run of uh, 500 milli electron volts. So. I would say that this is, a, 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 this is a success in the way that we are being able to trace back the features observed in the experimentally in the optical conductivity to the presence of these multiple fermions in the material. So, so far uh, we have discussed the linear regime of the optical response where we are only considering uh, one uh, single frequency. When we go to second order uh, responses, uh, we have the two Fourier components of the, of the electric field, and we can have a destructive interference of these two Fourier com, uh, components that give, give rise to the, to the, um, the effect uh, DC current in the system known as the bulk photogalvanic effect. Uh, 
If these two uh, uh, components interfere constructively, they give rise to a response to two omega uh, known as the second home generation. So now it is interesting to, to know that this second home generation, perhaps some of you are familiar with uh, some measurements that were performed uh, a few years ago by, by Professor Liang Wu and his group, so also some other groups in tantalum arsenide, which is a vialsine metal. And the question was, uh, that they observed a giant, gigantic uh, second home generation. And the question was whether we could attribute this, that giant second home generation to the presence of topological bands in the system. So what we want to do here is to use our um, um, generalized valve fermions and compute the second home generation in the in this system. The problem is that with uh, computing second home generation is uh, quite computationally expensive. And in the simplest model, uh, it is just too symmetric and the second home generation is, is zero. It, it has inversion symmetry, but it lacks uh, other uh, properties. Like it's too symmetric to, to this place second home generation. So in order to, to compute this, we will focus on the threefold fermion that we know that dominates the low energy optical regime uh, of the of the of Rodham city side, and we will use a, a second order uh, k dot p model, second order in momentum, uh, that has a sufficiently low symmetry to exhibit a second harm generation. So here I show you the 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 bands with the with the position of the Fermi level estimated from the optical conductivity, and here are some of the characteristic uh, characteristic activation frequencies for a single photon in the system. So. When we compute the, the, the second home generation in the system, we observe that uh, we have two very large peaks at low energies. These two large peaks uh, could be considered uh, gigantic for a second home generation. Uh, interestingly enough, we see that, in fact, we can associate the, the position of the peaks to the one photon and two photon contributions to the second home generation in the system. And as we increase the the scattering lifetime that we introduce in the optical conductivity calculation, uh, these features are smeared and they basically uh, transfer the, the optical spectral weight. Uh, and we end up with a really uh, featureless and not so large uh, curve here. Also, as in the case of uh, the optical conductivity, the position of the Fermi level is crucial to, to predict how the, the second Fermi generation in the system will behave. So it would be great to have some experimental measurements of the, of the second home generation in this material, this regime. So we, we collaborated with, uh, with Professor Darius Torczynski and his group uh, who measured the second home generation in Rodium City site. But if you look at the, at the scale of the experimental data, there's a problem. Even in the lowest uh, energy values uh, of the experimental data, our k dot p model is not capable of capturing the the features at all. Not even the 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 the, the scale of the response, right? The, the the order of magnitude. So we compared our k dot p results with a much more complicated uh, DFT calculation performed by our colleague uh, Sharare Sayad, and we saw that when we consider the the hundred milliev scattering lifetime that we estimated from the optical conductivity. Uh, well, both system, both uh, methods qualitatively agree. Of course, DFT has many more contributions. So in order to reproduce the experiment using DFT, it is necessary to introduce a large correction called it the scissors uh, potential in the calculation, which was originally introduced to account for inaccurate band gaps in DFT, right? So here, what the scissors uh, correction is doing is to push away the occupied and empty energy states in the system. And we saw that in order to reproduce or capture the, the scale of the response, it is necessary to introduce a, a scissors potential of 1.23 electron volts, which is a huge scale compared to the scale of the bands we were discussing. So we don't have a model that describes simultaneously the low frequency regime and the medium frequency regime where the second home generation can be measured. So this is an open question. We don't know if our estimation of the K.P model is something that we can have in a, in a real material. So 
this as far as it goes for today. I would like to to thank the the people I have worked with uh, during this time. So especially my PhD advisor Adolfo Grushin, also Fernando de Juan um, and John uh, John Venderbos, who worked mainly on the DFT calculations for Rodimus City side and Cobalt City side. Uh, Professor Liangu, who was in charge of the uh, linear optical conductivity experiments, and Professor Boris Tonchinsky in charge of the second home generation uh, experiments. And I leave you here with uh, the main uh, results that I presented here. And of course, if you have any questions, I will be happy to, to discuss them. Thank you very much. Uh, the fourfold and the threefold. Yeah. Yeah. Is that like an artifact of considering a very simple case? Or so, so actually, it comes it comes from the addition of two types of optical transitions in the system. So it's not uh, it's not an artifact. I would say that it's something uh, quite fundamental associated to the to the fourfold fermion because let me many animations here. Uh, so basically, uh, there's a, a regime of energies where only this uh, low energy uh, transition is activated. And then there will be a second regime where we have both the low energy and the these higher energy transitions activated. Uh, the, the, um, the activation frequency for these transitions and the, um, and which and the optical selection rules leading to them are fixed by the symmetries of the Hamiltonian. So in this sense, I would say that it's quite fundamental. It's not just a, an artifact. And um, yeah, so. Yes, in the triple case. Well, I, I must say that both of these cases, um, so I said that um, these multiple fermions can be seen as a generalization of uh, the valve fermion with a higher spin. Um, if you consider the the e reps in each of the symmetry uh, high symmetry points, and you you compute the, the most general Hamiltonian allowed there, in some cases uh, you see that what you have is a is a is a Hamiltonian of the form H. Uh, here now, I don't know if you see it, so it's a k dot s. But this s instead of being a, a product of three spin matrices is a phi dependent, uh, uh, so it's uh, S X phi, S Y phi, and S Z phi. And only for some values of these five parameters, the system is completely symmetric, uh, isotropic. Uh, when we move away from this value, the, the spin is no longer a good quantum number. And of course, these optical selection rules break and we find different uh, optical responses and activation frequencies. But it's, so it's smoothly broken, broken, let's say, as you move from this value on this high, high symmetry, you start uh, uh, violating little by little the, the optical selection rules for the symmetric case. Yeah. So here, in fact, in the so it, it, this is a work by Adolfo and Fernando, and so there you have a valve fermion and you add a band, and the correction basically depends on the energy separation between the 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 upper band you are introducing and the valve crossing. Here, if you consider a model that's say as simple as the valve model they were considering you still get the quantization. So here, this is not just accidental. It's another band spoiling the quantization. Uh, this crossing has a um, um, behaves as a monopole of a very curvature in the system with a higher ch monopole charge. And you can see that, the, the for instance, the, the CPG response in this type of systems associated with the shift current uh, is quantized in terms of the churn number of the pairs of bands that contribute to the to the system. So here. This is sorry, still when you're basically considering uh, just the bands that end up uh, coming together to form 
yeah yes 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 so the 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 fact of having more bands involved does not spoil the quantization of course the when you consider um like higher energy bands usually i mean we don't have like a theorem something uh, strong for this but when we consider higher energy bands like the case of rhodium silicide that has this uh, dispersive band um we are already considering um uh, higher order corrections to the to the threefold uh, crossing at the high symmetry point, and uh, but still uh, there's a there's a work by Flickr and, and Adolfo uh, where they discuss uh, how the quantization can be not spoiled but not as perfect as one would expect for the simplest case in real materials. And in fact, in in this uh, in this paper. Um, by Zulani, uh, uh myself, and, and some, some other people, uh, we discussed the, the CPG of rhodium silicide using this same, uh, this same type binding model. As a comment, perhaps, uh, there, there are many ideas that were originally proposed for uh, vial fermions that are being revisited now for these uh, multiple fermions because they have an interesting feature that is you don't have uh, opposite chiralities of the same energy, and also you have a, a wide window in energy to explore the only the topological bands. You don't have uh, many more bands uh, near the, the the bands that define the in the materials, in the materials where you that, that host these uh, multiple frames. What about uh, taking different systems of measurements one way you break? Symmetry that protects the point, so to get rid of all this stuff that you don't want to have. So, can, can you say that again? So, you, you break the you break symmetry that protects the, the mark of the mm -hmm. um, You probably wouldn't change too much for all the other bands that uh, spoil your, your signal. signal. Yeah, you, you mean this CPG signal or? Yes, yes. Yeah. And then take the difference in the signal. To see the so the effect, remove, remove the contributions from mm -hmm. other bands you might have near the Fermi level. Yeah. So the thing is that typically in the materials there are really not uh, many bands near the Fermi level. So the the next band in energy is like one electron volt uh, electron volt above the the Fermi level. So what is spoiling the quantization is the fact that the that the tight binding model, of course, is not just linear in K, and we cannot predict as easily the quantization. It's, it's not the presence of other bands just uh, happen to be around there. It's just the tight binding model itself that doesn't lead to a perfect uh, quantization in the system. Maybe I can ask one last question. Um, uh, absent from any of the discussion is uh, the uh, Coulomb problem. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, we know that when we use the Coulomb function for differential systems, as they focus the most insulated, we have an upper and a lower other band. <laughs> what happens to your fascinating Dirac points when you have an upper and lower other band? Do you think? Uh, uh, the honest answer is that I don't know. I don't have any, any clue right now to answer that uh, with a with a principle behind it. Um, as a, in particular, I just want to note that an upper and lower other band are like bosons. They have no spin degree. No spin They're like dumb oh. bonds. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and empty occupied space. So, so I'm curious to know what quantum numbers these upper and lower other bands would actually have when you turn on strong interaction. So, so would they do would they lose one quantum that have become like bosonic or cones or something like that? So you you mean the the um, the bands uh, meeting in this uh, in this uh, points yes. were okay. So the, the thing is that we can uh, uh, so this there's a twofold question here. Um, as I smoothly crank up interactions, I would expect something like at the beginning to. We normalize the Fermi velocity of the system, and then I will. Sure. And then uh, the, the second, so I, I don't know specifically uh, the answer to that. What I can say is that in particular here, 
you you do have a uh, bosonic uh, a threefold fermion because it has spin one mm -hmm. in the sense of spin right. uh, the wave function is still on this metric it's right so it's three. So, so what your six fold general Dirac cohen what do you want to call it three fold so that depends on the space group where the, the, the crossing appears, because you can do this search of the, of the irreps that gives rise to the, to the crossings for both uh, spinless and spin orbit coupled cases. And in general, the type of crossing you will find is radically different in both cases. So I cannot provide a general answer. Like when I am considering spin orbit coupling cases, is the only way to find, for example, these six-fold uh, crossings and then the only way of moving that to a threefold crossing um, while preserving the symmetry is to kill the spin orbit coupling in the well, system. Also make the excitation into the boson. I'm trying to think about slave folds and doublons. They, they would now acquire mm. this symmetry. Anyway, let me leave it mm. as a question. To you. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, well, thank you. Any further questions before we break the day? Okay, let's break the day. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, we will resume at 10 o'clock. And who is our first leader? Online.